Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, morning mili wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pods, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Fahid Siddiqui. He is the driving force behind our story. Before we invite Fahid into the studio, we want to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. Give the gift of giggles. And you can make magic happen for a child in crisis by helping the sponsor a clown show. Uh, Clowns Without Borders, they're all about helping kids in crisis. Uh, Just imagine for a minute a child in crisis. They feel scared, lonely, and forgotten. But when they meet a clown, something magical happens. They're transported to a world of play and imagination where they feel loved, accepted, and seen. It's an incredible thing to witness, and it's the power of your support. I just had the pleasure, the joy of witnessing it this uh, this past month. I was part of Clowns Without Borders and their tour of El Salvador. What an amazing experience, and it really is a magical thing. Today, I, I want to invite you to become a joy maker. Uh, joy makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make others feel good. When you join Joymakers, you're supporting laughter and play throughout the year for some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. As a Joymaker, in addition to knowing that you're making a difference in the lives of vulnerable children, you'll receive exclusive stories via email that tell you how your gift is making a difference in children's lives. And of course... You'll get a year in tax summary so that you can file early. So please take a moment to visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me and the rest of the clowns in bringing a smile to some of the most vulnerable kids and their families all around the world. This is going to be a fascinating episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Join us right now from Puerto Seguro in the beautiful country of Brazil. Our guest is here today. He's the driving force behind our story publishing house. Please welcome to the show, Fahad Siddiqui. Hey, Fahad, how are you? Hey, Jelly. Good. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm excited to have you on uh, our story Sounds like a really fascinating venture. Tell us all about it, please. Sure. I mean, um, it kind of was born out of the passion for recognizing that there were certain bits of information that seemed to be missing from education um, in the general education system globally, especially where we grew up. We were, I'm in, from London. I was born and raised there. And my partners are also British. So in theory, the British education system is seen as being quite forward and everyone kind of reveres it. But um, my cousin came to me with a question a few years ago, asking if I'd heard of a man called Mansa Musa. And I had not. Um, it turns out that he had been, well, he is technically the richest man that's ever lived. Um, his wealth was doubled out of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk today, if you adjust it for inflation. And he was a man who was around in the 14th century in Mali. He was the emperor of Mali in Africa. And I was baffled when I heard this because you know, I went to a pretty good school system. I had uh, access to, to good teachers and textbooks. And then I went to university. It was the London School of Economics. So money was kind of the topic of the day. Uh, but this man who had all this wealth was had never come across um, my my radar before so learning about him really opened our eyes into 
and to who else may there have been um, that people aren't aware of and that led us down a rabbit hole where we discovered you know 100 plus individuals uh, from around the world who've done all kinds of incredible things including the second uh, figure that we covered in our in our series called Fatima al Fairy, who founded the world's first university um, which is still standing today it's in Morocco and it was founded by a female who was a refugee um, hundreds, and th- hundreds of years ago um, so our higher education system was set up essentially by um, a female female back in in north africa a long time ago and i you know those stories i think would play a big part in today's global society in understanding who's contributed to what when how and uh, try and create a, a a more equal playing field for people in terms of their expectations of what is possible both from themselves and from other people that they see in society um, because there's quite a, a warped view, um, especially in the curriculum, but also in the media. Um, so having figures like this who've actually done things many hundreds of years ago, um, we found to be a very useful thing to, to shout about. So we turned those into these children's books um, and we've launched those and we have another series coming out, nothing to do with history, but again, to fill the gap in terms of what is being taught at schools so that people are best positioned to contribute to society in a positive way when they grow up. Well, I love that idea that we're trying to change people's perspective of what is possible within themselves and within each other. I think that that's um, an incredibly important mission to have. And I think it's something that we've been um hopefully doing here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, we talk a lot about representation here on the podcast and how important it is for others, to for for folks to see themselves, for kids to see themselves and and, and people who look like them positively portrayed on the pages of books. I think it's just as important for kids from outside of those uh, those cultures and ethnicities and races to be able to see people who they might think of as different in these really positive um, uh, stories. And uh, so I think that what you're doing with our story is perfect. When you refer to our story, who is the R? Who, who are the group that, 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 whose story that you're telling? For me, for us, it's humankind, civilization. We're all basically one. We've added these borders and flags and nations over time, which have constantly moved over history. Um, So it makes more sense to put us all together, especially with the mission that we have, um, because it's a collective survival story, basically, of, of humankind and how we got to where we've got to, all the inventions and rituals and beliefs and systems um, have spawned from the learnings and teachings of previous generations from all over the world. So the hour is in global encompassment of everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, it's our combined story that we're sharing right now. The man from, from Mali, the woman from um, Morocco, or the next man from China, from the second Song Dynasty, who discovered climate change from looking at fossilized bamboo. You know, it's all information that we as a, as humanity have established. And um, I think it's important to think of us all as one as much as possible. I agree. And I love that. And we talk a lot here in the podcast about the fact that we are all part of this one beautiful human family. Um, and you mentioned something earlier, uh, both in this conversation and the conversation that we we're having prior to uh, the beginning recording, is that the media, whether it's newspapers, television, social media, books, uh, they, 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 they focus on the negative. You know, there's there's a story, the the expression in newspapers, if it bleeds, it leads, and that that works for television, newspapers. It's 
you know, we need to get eyeballs on this content for whatever reason. And the best way to get eyeballs on content is by scaring people and yeah. making them worried and creating these perceptions of different peoples and different parts of the world um, that are really detrimental, not only to the people that are being maligned, uh, but also to, to those of us outside who aren't able to see the beauty of a culture or of a person. Yeah, it's a shame. It seems like the news and the media have figured out this algorithm of uh, creating sensational headlines. If they just want eyeballs, they're, they're trying to make as, have as many viewers for the advertisers. It's, it's unfortunately been contaminated quite a lot by capitalism from my standpoint. Um, even, even the non-capital driven entities that are more nationalistic in nature, such as for example, they also have their own biases and agendas, it seems. Um, and it's, you know, we're, it's all run by humans at the end of the day. These corporations make it seem like it's, uh, there's a system and there's a process and there's fairness, but ultimately the thing behind it, the driving force, are, are people and we are all flawed and we all have interests that seem to push narratives in one direction or another. Um, I don't know the in, in, inner workings of, of all these establishments and why they choose to do what they do. Um, I do think that people have become smarter, uh, especially recently with technology and access to information from everywhere. I mean, for example, the US used to be seen as, you know, the place to go for dreams to come true. And that was the, the general narrative throughout the 20th century. But since, you know, mobile phones and social media has come out, you can see some of this br police brutality and other instances of issues in the U.S., which has kind of um, affected that rose-tinted vision of what the U.S. was. So I feel that slowly now with technology and access to, to seeing things um, firsthand almost, um, it's, it's shifting people's understandings of what their previous perceptions may have been um and i think it's we're in this stage of just we're in this information age as they put it right well, i think we're just overloaded with information right now we're not built to deal with this much information we've never had this much information in the history of human kind um so i think now it's the case of filtering through all of that and understanding you know what makes sense to share what doesn't how to put any kind of safeguards in place for different things. Um, so I think we're we're just learning all of this as we speak. Um, and our effort is not to try to adjust whatever's happening in real time and really present what we've already had done in the past um, effectively and highlight those stories and hopefully create role models like you, you mentioned for people to understand that it's possible for them to also create or do or be or invent or whatever mm -hmm. um, themselves, regardless of the noise that may be happening uh, right now and what narratives are being fed to them. Yeah. I, so much to, to kind of dive into. I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about um, guys and women who are super rich don't, they, they don't excite me, but this woman that created the first university Talk, yeah. so tell me a little bit more about her. So Fatima Ferry, um, she actually was a refugee from uh, Tunisia and she came over with her sister and her father uh, to Morocco. And eventually she learned that there was a need to create some kind of education institution off the back of her religious practices. She was a Muslim, practicing Muslim and trying to teach those teachings evolved into other branches of education and she was able to self-sustain to sustainably build a property using sustainable methods because this was again hundreds of years ago so she used the rocks and the earth in the land around her to put this together um, and there's many many interesting people and scholars who came and studied there from across africa and other parts of the world um, once they heard about this place and the things like the the graduation hat that we wear at university that's flat at the top 
that was also they say uh, was inspired by um that period of time because they used the same concept to rest their books so it wasn't on the ground um which is also something they did for the religious books religious texts the quran for example they didn't want that to be on the ground they wanted it to be on a raised platform to show it respect so all of these little intricate details um they all com combined and created this um, amazing um, environment where people were able to live and learn comfortably together from all backgrounds and, and delve deeper into their own ideas and, and theories. And the fact that it was founded by a female show, just goes to show how advanced actually previous societies were, in fact, in allowing what as some might say today these kinds of cultures they don't give too much freedom and um, independence to uh, females for example however we're talking you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago there was already uh, someone who was allowed to you know create an institution um, back then so it's really just shifting a little bit of what the narrative is today that's kind of developed over the last 150 odd years with the radio and news and whatever, um, and showing how society's actually operated um, before. Because mm -hmm. one interesting thing, I think, Jedi, I'll explain to you how now I'm living in Brazil and it's, um, it's a small town where I am, but I was born and raised in London, um, which is the complete opposite, very high intensity city and now I went to school there, went to university there, um, and then I moved to South America, but also stayed in cities. And then pandemic happened, and I ended up coming to this place, which was a smaller place. And what I have come to recognize, which I tell other people uh, since, is that every time I visit a city or return back to London, it becomes clearer and clearer to me how um, manufactured and man-made some cities or most cities are. And they're kind of built not really for human well-being. They're more built for human efficiency, mm -hmm. like spending, making money and spending money. Um, that's kind of, it's not really um, to do with your own mental health or wellness or anything like that. And coming to a small place like this where there's a lot of nature and I assume this is how societies you know, pre-19th centuries were as well, even the bigger ones. They had a lot more interaction with nature or mm -hmm. with other people um and they weren't so driven by the need to make money to spend money to have whatever they don't really need to have um so i feel that you know society as we discussed also prior to the podcast that the values seem to be a bit muddled right now um and i think examples of what how things used to be um for hundreds of years successfully might serve people today into thinking thinking twice about how they operate yeah 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 you know as you were mentioning um uh fatima I, i'm i'm thinking you know the narrative that we hear today um uh about a lot of folks in in the muslim world is like oh afghanistan there the taliban is not allowing women to go to school and how terrible that is and that is terrible and but Instead of focusing on that and that being the first thing we think of when when somebody thinks of a culture that's different than ours, maybe we think of, hey, there's this hit rich history of of women in Islam being educated and being educational leaders. And maybe looking at that can be a way to get back to that and helping everybody understand that this uh, education is something that all cultures and religions have have um, embraced at one time or another. Exactly. I mean, just to, if we're talking about this specific point, I just like to add there that in Islam, because I'm Muslim um, from birth, but I'm still practicing today, and there's some stories I hear, but the fundamentals is this, the Prophet Muhammad, who's the main prophet that we mm -hmm. have. We also believe in Jesus, Abraham, and all the other prophets from biblical and, um, and the Torah, and Jewish and Christian faiths. However, in Islam, when it comes to women, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu his first wife was actually a woman who was older than him that was a principal breadwinner from, and she was just a tradesperson. And so if that was the dynamic 
from by for, that the prophet lived his life by it doesn't make sense that some of these cultures have adopted this whole alternative approach to how women are integrated in society or in culture or in the family so yeah there's there's a lot to learn from history um i was never a history major but you know growing up and, and living around the world and seeing things there is clearly a lot of information um and uh, interesting lessons to take away from what's already happened in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you, you mentioning that, you know, you kind of got into this uh, creating our story because your um, cousin or nephew came to you and said, hey, did you ever hear about this guy? Did, had you always dreamt of becoming a children's author and a publisher or was this just something like, hey, there's a need. I have to fill this. Um, no, I, I'd come, I'd always been interested in doing something for, in education, especially after seeing, uh, the TED talk by Mr. Ken Livingston or Sir King Livingston, um, who did a very interesting talk uh, 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, um, about how the education system itself is a bit flawed for today's society in the sense of how everyone's follows the Fordist mentality or approach of year groups you all study in the same age group and then you have an exam that you have to fulfill independently and that's you know how the system goes in the real world you actually work on projects collaboratively with a lot of other people to get it over the line and they're from all different age groups so just on that fundamental level of how it's set up there's a problem um and then this idea came to it was brought in front of me and it just sent me down this uh, path but since being down this path I've learned that there's actually quite a big movement that seems to be building momentum and changing the education system to be more skills based and less knowledge based mm -hmm. um, knowledge based is more learning things off by heart and memorizing them to pass the exam um, but skills based this is off the back of a report that I just came across last week in fact from the World Economic Forum um, for Education 4.0, they call it, um, which is basically put together a list of all the skills that seem to be most desirable from companies of today. Um, and it's a lot more about critical thinking and uh, creativity and you know, concepts that are quite different to what is taught in, in the traditional syllabi today. Um, and I believe that um, China is actually leading the charge and trying to integrate this into their whole state system in the next couple of years or so. So I think slowly and also obviously private schools and independent schools, they tend to do some more of this work usually. Mm -hmm. And the state schools are a bit slower to, to adapt. Um, but it seems to be moving in that direction. So the content that we seem to be creating right now fits that mold. Um, um, obviously, it's it's a new area, um, so there is content that needs to be created for it. So this is the global competence department with the series that we're doing and this Our Story series. And then the other series that I mentioned that we're due to launch called The Secret Alien Diaries. And that's more about life skills where you know, the main character practice, um, has four alien friends, secret alien friends. Um, and they have, she has to teach that those aliens how to operate in this world in a healthy, positive way. So one's about bedtime, not staying up too late, playing video games, and how to create a good bedtime routine. There's missions and activities to empower the kids. Um, and also because it's told through the eyes of a child telling aliens how to behave, it feels less like instructions and mm -hmm. uh, it provides a bit more encouragement for the child themselves to take on um, this responsibility of building a bedtime routine for themselves. The next one we're working on is about upcycling. There's a few different areas, but the idea is to create this content that serves people for the future, um, more so than what they may be taught at school or what they're being exam um, tested on in exams. Well, I love that. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of teaching to the test. I, and that's one of the things we love about reading. When you're reading with your kids, you're helping your kids de develop empathy. You're uh, helping them 
become better critical thinkers because you're asking them questions. You're interacting. You're bouncing different ideas off each other. Kids have the ability to um, uh, try out some ideas. You know, they they love you. They feel safe with you. And uh, maybe you're the person they can, um, you know, share this really wild imaginative idea with as opposed to doing it in school and getting shut down by your teacher. So um, exactly. good on well, you. We have fun discussion topics and things at the end of the books of our story, for example, for the parents or educators to ask their children, you know, if you were the richest person in the world, what would you do with your money? In the case of Mansa Musa, for example, mm-hmm. um, and those things really ignite something interesting or invite very interesting conversations um, from these uncontaminated children. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a uh, very it's very cool. I don't know. There's no real words to put to it uh, apart from seeing how how these kids react to to learning about these things and sharing their own views on on what could be possible. Yeah, I think very cool. I, th- th- I think those are good words to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, where can we go to find out more about our story? Yeah, we're we're. Our, our website, ourstory.media. You can find our books there, and where our books are. All, mostly published on Amazon right now. We self-published there. Um, so you can find copies of what we've released so far there. And then our social media is howstory.media for Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, where, where, wherever um, the eyeballs are. Awesome. We've had a really fun and fascinating time talking to the driving force behind our story. Our guest has been Fahid Siddiqui. Hey, my friend, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jed Lee, for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Fahid Siddiqui. Please be sure to visit his website, ourstory.media. We also want to thank our friends over at clownswithoutborders.org. Would you please take a moment to visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider becoming a joy maker. We'd be so grateful if you did. Hey, I want to thank my amazing team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Soji Franklin, and Old Mary. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.